Well, good evening, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, this IPR event. Thank you for coming when you could have been in a, in a pub garden somewhere uh, on a very lovely uh, evening. Um, we're delighted this evening to welcome James Pennell uh, to talk to us. James is the uh, Director of Radio and Education at the BBC, so one of the senior uh, leadership team at, at the BBC. And we, wanted to, we asked James to come because um, for two reasons. For, firstly, the BBC is an incredibly important institution in British public life, political life, the life of our communities. Um, it has recently been given a, a new mandate. Um, uh, it's had its mandate uh, refreshed, and I'll just briefly read you what the new mandate says. It says the BBC has to act in the public interest, serving all audiences with impartial, high quality and distinctive media content and services that inform, educate and entertain. That's its new mandate. And the reason for us thinking it was important to come and talk about the BBC, uh, in particularly in that context, was, well, of course, we are being told that we now live through an era of fake news, of post-truths, when the idea of informing people, of educating people, uh, at best, have become problematic. Um, entertaining, perhaps, we have, a, we have a US president you might call entertaining uh, in his use of Twitter, but whether he educates and informs in his engagement with the public is perhaps an another matter. So thinking about how the, what the BBC does in the context of politically turbulent times when trust in facts, statistics, evidence, experts, all of these things are under pressure. And of course, these are existential questions for universities. Universities committed in what they do to the pursuit of truth and knowledge rigour, expertise, scientific standards of evidence in the service of the public good. These are very important questions uh, for us to, to, to understand. So I'm going to run this as, a, as an in-conversation event with James, so that instead of, instead of there being a lecture, we're going to talk about things and then we can open it up to, uh, to questions. Um, I know James very well, known for many years, but you may not do quite as much. So I'm going to start by asking you, James, um, just to say a little bit about how you came to, to, to work in media policy, how you came to be uh, doing what you're doing at the BBC. Uh, so I, uh, I grew up in France, I suppose it's a good place to, to start. And uh, one of the things about being an expat in France is you really looked to, uh, to home. And in the 1970s, uh, the one me medium you could get was Radio 4 and Longwave. So, you know, I grew up in a sort of French environment, falling in love with, uh, with the BBC. It was the only way you could get sports news was to, used to be a Tony Lewis sports programme on a Saturday morning. And it was either that or driving into Paris and getting two-day-old newspapers. So I sort of fell in love with the BBC, BBC that way. And then uh, after university, I worked um, uh, in Labour Party politics. I worked for Tony Blair in 1990 to 1992, and then Labour lost the 92 election, so I was looking to do something else and went into uh, strategic media consultancy and then into the BBC until 1997. So I was then when we were doing the kind of the first wave of digital strategy. Uh, the BBC went quite boldly into the internet and having one of the big first news online uh, sites into doing digital channels. Uh, then uh, we were both in government uh, uh, until 2010. I was Secretary of State for Culture, Media uh, and Sport and then decided I'd had enough of politics and left and was, uh, uh, was making films. I made a, a film about gangs in Birmingham who had been at war for 20 years and dozens of people had died and they were trying to, to build a truce. So I was doing that and I was about to set up an indie, uh, an independent production company. And then George Entwistle, who's the previous Director General, resigned after 54 days. Tony Hall was asked to come in as new Director General, and he asked me to go back to the BBC, so I did. So, I don't know, couldn't say there was a plan in how we got <laughs> to that, but that's how I did it. And so for, for the last few years, I've been uh, running the policy and strategy part of the BBC and the digital part of the BBC. The big part of that was leading our pitch for, for Charter Review, which was the process that uh, 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 that we were just talking, uh, Nick was just talking about, and after that, I was, I've changed jobs, and I now look after the arts, children's, radio, music, and education parts of the of the BBC. So, all, all the sort of content parts of the BBC that aren't news, television, or the nations. 
So, so you, you've been a cabinet minister running some big departments. Mm -hmm. What what would you say is the sort of biggest difference between a, between being a politician doing that and yeah. being in a big national institution like the BBC? That is a, that is a great question. The, the big difference is you don't have to justify yourself in the same way. You know, the, if you're running, if, if you're Jeremy Hunt and you are running the NHS, overseeing the NHS, whatever verb he would use, most people are not using it every day. So you are always <laughs> having to justify what you're doing and try and you know, work out how you get through the media to persuade people of what you're, what you're doing. With the BBC, people, 95% of people use the BBC every week. So people, people form their own view. And, you know, we track this quite carefully. If the organisation itself has a, uh, a bad patch, it affects what people think of the BBC a little bit. There's, there's, a, there's some groups who are affected by, by that. People who are sceptical about the licence fee, if the management is being questioned in the news, that has an effect on their approval of the BBC. But most people just judge it on, you know, mm. the Today programme and CBBS and Strictly. And so, so there's just a there's a there's a huge relief that comes from people make their mind up based on the quality of the service rather than the communication. But is, it, is there a danger with that then, that you? In a sense, you just take your accountability for granted, yeah. because you're just part. You're embedded in the life of the of the na of the nation. That you sort of, in a sense, you just assume that your legitimacy is taken, you know, as read. And 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 then when a crisis strikes, you think, well, where are our supporters? I'm thinking particularly about what happened, you know, yeah. um, after Iraq, the Kelly affair, and so yeah. on. Suddenly, there was a, a crisis for the entire BBC management yeah. and its governors. You know, we had a resignation of both the board, you know, the chair of the governors and the director general. Yeah. Is there a danger that you take your, as it were, rootedness and accountability to society for granted? I think you can have a danger on both sides. So actually, I think the BBC, uh, if it's not careful, we can become too focused on politicians and opinion formers. Mm. Uh, actually, I think that's a good example. I don't think either the chairman or the director general should have resigned, uh, mm. actually. And uh, I think it is perfectly acceptable for people to make mistakes and to continue in, in, in the role that they were, they were in. Uh, we worry an awful lot about serving all audiences. You know, if, if you came into a meeting of the BBC board, you know, the most common topic of conversation would be young audiences are using us less. What do we do? What does inform, educate and entertain mean today? So we, we, and we focus on that because A, we think it's right and B, we know that that uh, leads to um, approval, and if there's strong approval for the BBC, then that underpins the politics. So, uh, to then go to the next example of, of, of a crisis, you know, after Savile, BBC very much being questioned. Uh, John Whittingdale was appointed as a Secretary of State, who raised some, mm. you know, some big questions about the BBC. You had a very strong public reaction. Two hundred thousand people responded to the consultation, arguably more than have ever responded. It's either that or the gay marriage uh, uh, consultation. Uh, but that was just a sort of yes or no. There's actually 200,000 people filled in questionnaires and wrote in. Yeah. So, so if you, if you fulfil your public purposes, are genuinely universal, make good programmes and do good, then actually you, you need to balance that with proper accountability and thinking about the public interest and showing how you're doing it. Mm. But you can protect yourself a little bit from the fact that politicians do have quite a lot of sway over the BBC every, every 10 years. Every 10 years, yeah. Can, let's just focus a little bit on the uh, changes in the, in the media landscape itself then. So, you know, I, you refer to the 1992 election. You know, I can remember elections where, you know, what was broadcast on the BBC from a morning press conference yeah. was, was the content of a general election yeah. campaign. That was kind of basically it, really. And the newspapers would then run something which would flow in the next day. We've just been through an election where people say, actually, you know, their campaign messages were getting through on social media, Facebook, yeah. not through traditional broadcast or broadsheet or tabloid. I mean, is that fair? I mean, is the media landscape changing in a way that's, you know, really profoundly changing how we do our public life in this country? I think yes and no. So, yes, in that the TV broadcast or the radio show are, are less important than they were. They're still very, very important. I mean, you've still got five or six million people watching the six and the ten mm. uh, on the BBC. You know, over ten million people come to Radio 4 every, every week. 
the day after the election, 25 million people came to the BBC website. Right. So people are getting, it's more, I think, so, so, so that's the no part of it. The yes part of it is people are getting their news from a far, far wider range of sources. So if you look at someone's consumption 30 years ago, it would have been, you know, the BBC, their newspaper, and the Spectator. And, you know, it would have been two or three things. Now it is dozens and dozens of things. And one of the ways that audiences are responding to fake news, opinionated news, you know, balkanized news, global news, is by having lots of different sources and then sort of making their mind up on the balance uh, overall. That then means the role of the BBC becomes... It's sort of the same role, which is due impartiality, objectivity, checking your facts, giving your judgment. But it's the place, it's one of the places that people go sort of to check what's true and to get, uh, uh, get a comprehensive story of what's going on. And they then have that you know, as one of the spines of the content that they're getting from lots of, lots of places. Yeah. And it, do, does that work for young people? So, uh, you know, I read that the average age of somebody uh, watching or consuming the BBC is now 61. Um, you might expect that in, yeah. in an ageing society. Of course, it, you know, the average age will go up. But young people, do they engage with the BBC when they do their politics? I mean, they voted in record numbers at the election. But uh, did they come to the BBC for that? Yes. Yes, they do. I mean, they... And so that's the difference between uh, a traditional viewer who would come to the 10 o'clock news, mm. uh, a younger consumer, a BBC consumer, more likely to get their news through Radio 1 than through BBC 1. Uh, mm -hmm. And they would be getting, you know, a lot of BBC content through Facebook. So there's lots of news content on, on Facebook or on, uh, or on, on, on Twitter. So, um, it, you know, so it is, I don't want to underplay it, it's something that we worry about a lot. It's my biggest priority. You know, we, we reach 92% of 16 to 44s every week. Uh, four years ago, that was 95%. You know, we don't want that trend to go, to keep on going down. Mm -hmm. We don't want to go... Uh, uh, get to a point where there's a group of people not using the BBC uh, uh, regularly. Um, but by, by using social and radio and TV, and by having services like Radio 1, which are big and popular, and you can put the news in them, you mm. continue to be a key part of people's news, news diet. And mm. you know, ha having said that we're worried about reach, you know, young people still use the BBC more than they use Snapchat, YouTube and Facebook combined. So, so it's still a big, big yeah. part of people's, people's consumption. I think one thing that you know, academic studies of social media show is that they do tend to polarise yeah. audiences, that um, you tend to speak to people like yourself, you tend to consume yeah. media from sources that, um, as it were, confirm and validate your identity. Yeah. Um, and we saw in this election, people would have seen uh, the impact of sort of hyper-partisan sides, particularly on the left, actually, in, in a way that people have thought was more true of the, of the alt-right in the States and Europe, but actually we saw particularly on the left in yeah. Britain recently. It, it, you can't follow those sites because by definition, if you're there to, end, you know, to inform and educate and you've got rules about partisanship that govern how you report elections, you can't follow those sites to their hyper-partisan positions. How do, you, how do you, as it were, place yourself in the kind of line of sight of people who are consuming media precisely because it validates an identity that they yeah. have. Look, I, I think you can, you can also uh, have, a, think, have a more dystopian vision of now than is, than is necessarily true. You know, when I, I grew up, was growing up, people would read The Guardian, or they'd read The Mirror, or they'd read The Sun. So people would worry that you were only getting your views mm. from one particular uh, newspaper, mm. and schools and people who cared about citizenship did a lot to educate people about, you know, What's this source? Where does it come from? Who's the owner? I, I think this is, a, in many ways, still a very new type of media, and people are learning you know, how to... So, in fact, that thing about having lots of sources is one of the ways that people are, uh, are learning how to, how to cope with a different type of media. So, I, I think there are huge benefits to what... I think, actually, overall, this is a much better media than I had growing up. You know, mm. you, the, the, the range and depth of things that you can find on social media, the access to free newspapers from all over the world is an unbelievable thing compared to, yeah. uh, compared to the 19, 1980s. Uh, and there's huge innovation going on in the news as well. You look at something like Vox, for example, you know, brilliant quality content uh, on, uh, on social media. We obviously, there's a practical problem, which is it's much harder to follow opinion online than it is just to do the cuttings. You used to be able just to kind of, you know, Look at you know, 10 newspapers and you, know, uh, you can't do that any, uh, anymore. 
we will follow those stories if they are editorially valid. So, mm -hmm. you know, there was a story on, you know, uh, so Nick Robinson did a thing called Political Thinking, uh, a podcast that people might have, might have listened to. You know, he did a whole item with Paul Mason talking about uh, left media, his criticisms of the mainstream media, of the BBC. You know, when, when an issue comes up through something like the Canary, which is a proper journalistic issue, we would follow that in the same way that if the Daily Mail comes up with a story, which is a proper journalistic issue, we will follow it. The key thing is not to follow it because you are worried about being criticised by the people who read that for, for being biased because you're not, you're not following it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And how, how do you... How does the BBC kind of cope with this question of, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's thought, you know, thought of as fake news, as it, what you can trust as reliable evidence yeah. um, when claims are made using, you know, evidential bases, statistics and all the rest of it. Is it just that you just have to carry on doing what journalists have always done, which is to try to track down whether those sources are correct, you know, whether they can be... Whether, uh, you know, and is that enough, I suppose, in, 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 in the context of where the rapid dissemination of this kind of yeah. fake news is such that you don't wait for a newspaper to be published the next day to carry it, or you yeah. wait for a programme at 10 o'clock. It's yeah. just there. Yeah. That's a very good question. So uh, some of it is just being good journalists. You know, some of it is... And the, the problems the, of, the, of the economic model of print journalism, I think, puts even more... Um, uh, obligation on the BBC to, you know, with foreign news stories, for example, to properly resource, resource that and have the capability to do classic journalism. I think, secondly, you know, we will talk increasingly about the fact that, you know, we're not here to serve the market or the state. You know, that there is a real space for the public service provider in the internet, sort of public service space mm. in the internet. It's a, it's a very noticeable difference with how you know, when broadcasting was founded in, in Europe, it was all funded as public service. You know, it was only the BBC in the UK, similar with, you know, the internet has been founded, although it came out of a public service space with Tim Berners-Lee, with Jimmy Wales, etc. You know, it's quite a limited number of public service providers, and I think we would like to be part of making sure that there's a proper public service space, which is only really there to serve audiences, make good programmes and do good with those, those programmes. And then you innovate. So we've had a thing called uh, Reality Check, which we did in the last election, which we've now made permanent, which is uh, a team of seven people who will go and check if things are true uh, and exercise judgment. Mm -hmm. um, so Donald Trump, you mentioned at the start, you know, he did a thing, a tweet at one point saying that the media weren't reporting uh, terrorist attacks uh, which were uh, not committed by... Uh, what, was the, what was the claim? It was that we were un under-reporting uh, terrorist attacks um, by Muslims on Muslims, I think it was. And, you know, we went through and evidenced the fact that we had done it and other media had done it. So, yeah. so there's a sort of there's a, uh, innovation in that way. I think you'll see more technological innovation as well. You know, it, one of the things which I think is fake news is important, but just as important as bots on the internet, being able to mm -hmm. amplify uh, fake news stories... Uh, often not stories which have been created by, uh, for nefarious reasons or by you know, state, quasi-state organisations. Sometimes there's an example in the election of, a, uh, of Macron of a story which came out of um, uh, French West Indies where uh, some allegation about Macron which was picked up automatically by a whole bunch of bots on the internet and then mm -hmm. became such a big story that it was covered as a legitimate story yeah. by, the French, by the French media. You know, there will be, I think, over the next few years, innovations at the interface between journalism and technology to be able to check, you know, can we check the, people's, the coherence of people's argument? Can we check the facts in people's arguments using a combination of uh, machines, machine learning and uh, journalism? Because one thing I think people will be interested to, to understand is the question of how you achieve balance in your reporting... Yep. When, and let's, let, let's take the example of climate change, where the overwhelming scientific consensus is yeah. you know, that, that humankind's activities cause climate change, that climate change is real and is happening. Uh, there will be dissenting, and there are dissenting voices to that consensus, yeah. um, but they are at the margins. Yeah. Now, my understanding is that the BBC, in those circumstances, is not under an obligation to give 50% of the time to the dissenting voices. Yeah. Uh, it should give 
coverage that's appropriate to the weight of opinion. Yeah. So you might cover somebody at the margins, but you won't do it more than 5% of the time. Yeah. And is that true of climate change and is that true of other kinds of issues? How, can we, how, do, we, how do we as an audience think about how you achieve balance? So we publish and produce guidelines, which are principles under which we, uh, uh, we work, and they evolve over time. They're, they're very formed by precedent. And climate change is a great example. For, for a while, the BBC was being, we're never numerically balanced, but was trying to sort of achieve a, a balance. And we did a review. And actually, for exactly that reason, because there's a clear scientific consensus, we, uh, we reflect that in our coverage. Uh, and the words that we use in the, in the guidelines are not impartiality, it's due impartiality. So in, mm -hmm. that, in, 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 that, in that case, you know, you, you, you should reflect the fact that there are people who disagree. That's part of the, the debate. They might be right. You, you, you never know. But you, A, don't pretend that they have got equivalent uh, scientific support. And B, you don't put up um, someone who's a non-scientist against a scientist pretend that that's a scientific, uh, a scientific debate. So where else is that true? You know, democracy, freedom of speech, just, just, yeah. um, safe childhood. You know, there's quite a lot of things where... Um, animal, uh, animal welfare. There's a whole bunch of things where we have values which uh, uh, are reflected in our in, in our coverage. Um, but when it comes to something like the economy or uh, the European referendum, we are uh, due impartiality takes you in a different place. And then when you go into a formal election period or a formal referendum period, mm. then you are there is a, again it's not numerical. Uh, balance, mm. but it's a more formal type of yeah, type of balance. Yeah. And I suppose, I mean, there, a number of Jeremy Corbyn supporters would say one of the reasons why Labour did better than people expected was because those rules kicked into play during yeah. the campaign, and yeah. prior to that, he had not been given a, a fair hearing. I mean, do you think, is, is there any... I, mean, I, I would imagine you would deny that he wasn't given a fair hearing in the past, but there is a sense in which the, the, the election campaign allowed a, a, a more balanced public debate than might otherwise have been the case. We were very conscious of uh, that that was our role. Uh, so, you know, we don't lead on polls in election time. Uh, in the manifesto um, uh, coverage, for example, you, if you looked at what the newspapers would have covered, they all went on the leak. Where did it come from? You know, we very much went on nationalisation, uh, student debt. You know, we went on the choices and the... Uh, and, you know, in the... In the be interesting to think whether they thought we did that better than other parts of the, the media. You know, we're always willing to look back and, and see whether there are lessons mm. to be learnt uh, about our, our coverage. If you sort of went into a newsroom, you would be pleased, I think, to see quite how sort of candid, verging on forceful people are about whether they got stuff stuff right. You know, we were reflecting uh, the political debate within the Labour Party about Jeremy Corbyn's leadership. So, mm. so there's a. Th we are not here to set the agenda. We are here to challenge and investigate and give our judgment on what is happening in politics, and that's what we were covering in the period before, before the election. I suppose a, another angle to that question is the one of how do kind of new voices come through in public yeah. debate and in politics? Yeah. So, again, you, you see people, certainly the Labour Party, would say, well, you know, the real debate was, was happening in the kind of new left media, yes. supporters of Corbyn and others. They, they're not appearing on Question Time, and they're not yes. getting invited to perhaps, apart from Paul Mason, perhaps, invited yeah. to do, you know, the Today programme and yeah. so on. I mean, at what point do you have a kind of responsibility to say, OK, those voices are out there, they're being yeah. listened to, they're important, they've got to come through into our yeah. mainstream broadcasting? So that is something that we work on the whole time and uh, we don't always get right because people are busy, you know, and, and to, to, book, to book guests, you know, you, mm. people do quite often. So I think three or four years ago we were worrying more about... You know, you could get, uh, how do you get non-metropolitan Labour in London voices? Mm. So, you know, how, how did you get people on Newsnight who weren't either a Cameroon Tory or a sort of Corbyn Labour or uh, Peter Mandelson Labour? You know, there are lots of other voices who weren't. So, you know, we've had concerns before about not getting enough uh, women experts on. Mm. So what we then do in very classic BBC ways, we'll have an initiative, we'll set up a training scheme, we'll get a, if necessary, we'll get a database. Um, and we'll try and make sure that we get uh, a new uh, set of, uh, uh, of contributor. 
um, and then probably those become the Freemasons of the future, and then you've got to sort of do it, do do it, it all over again. Yeah, so yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there's some, some validity, validity to that, and we will... You know, it's, it's one of the things that we're constantly on the, on the lookout for. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me ask you a little bit about um, some of your other responsibilities, and um, you know, in particular, uh, let's start with education. I mean, I, I can remember growing up, um, for my, my primary school years being very sort of marked by being trooped into the assembly hall to watch a sort yeah. of black and white television, you know, I think it became colour later in my primary school years, uh, to watch the... very old. <laughs> to, to, watch, to watch the, the, you know, the children's broadcasting, yeah. you know, the education, the school's education yeah. broadcasting. Um, and uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was an experience which was shared by, by a whole generation because yeah. that's what you did through your school. Now, of course, now children consume from all sorts yeah. of different sites and schools draw resources from, from all over the place. Yeah. Um, I mean, do you still have this role? I mean, it's in your mandate, but do you really still have a role for educating the country's <coughs> children? We do. We want to do it better. Uh, so uh, there's a service called Bite Size, like the people who've gone through the uh, British education system. It's actually more used by teenagers than any other BBC service. Right. It's, it's appreciated by... Uh, teenagers and loved by their parents uh, uh, quite quite often. So yeah, eighty percent of teenagers you use bite size. Um, so we still got that role. Truth is, we've slightly retrenched. So you may remember there was in the last charter review there's a very ambitious plan which David Putnam put together, which was for the BBC to offer a curriculum across the whole sort of digital yeah. curriculum yeah. across the whole of the syllabus, and uh, then the sort of industry, the people who make textbooks decided that was going to damage their business. There's a whole furore about it, and the BBC retreated and went back into its shell a little bit. And I think, I mean, I wasn't there at the time, but it feels like the BBC maybe didn't make its case as well as it, as it, as it could have done. Mm. And, you know, it would have been better if a bit like the iPlayer, we could have persuaded people that, yes, we'll be offering services that people like, but we'll be creating a, a habit, and then there'll be a commercial, a greater commercial market will come from, from that. It feels to me that, you know, with with digital learning, particularly lifelong learning, actually particularly for adults, that's something where there's now a gap between how much potential there is and how much people are actually using it and doing it. So yeah. we are now current, right in the middle of thinking, what, would, what should the BBC's role be here? Is there, a, is there a cradle to grave role for the BBC to provide something which is the kind of public service equivalent of what we do on, on television and end on, yeah. and on radio? answers on a postcard about the things that we should be uh, yeah, or we'll, an email or we'll on a tweet we we'll definitely pick yeah. that up i mean one thing that is, is still remarkably similar to when i was growing up is is radio is yeah. the resilience of radio yeah. audiences i mean people still listen to yeah. the today program radio yeah. one i mean what, what what explains this why do people still listen to the radio so much um it's great uh, <laughs> you can get ed miliband talking about flushing toilets you know all sorts of um, amazing amazing things if people don't know by the way ed miliband has been doing radio to jimmy vine show this week and um i mean i don't know how it got onto the conversation about toilets but he was asking viewers to flush their to listeners to flush their toilets uh, or something i don't know either but i, I spent a day with the um the team and they've got an amazing team of researchers and they'll have got up in the morning read the papers something will have made them think of it. They'll have thought it's funny for Ed to do it. They'll have wanted to get a bit of coverage for, mm. uh, for the fact that Ed was deputising uh, for Jeremy Vine. They'll have thought, they'll have done a little deal with a couple of news outlets to, so you know, there was a very funny section on PM where they sort of had the best of Ed Miliband. So yeah. okay. that's how it happened. Um, unless Ed came up and so came in and said, I want to do a thing on toilets. Who, who knows? Um, but anyhow, it, it's good. It's a very modern medium. You know, we're all multitaskers now. We're trying to cram as many things into uh, into a busy day, and people love doing audio whilst um, whilst doing something else. Uh, it can be a very it's a very internet friendly medium in many ways. The whole podcasting experience. You know, people going so there's both the sort of background. I'm doing the dishes. I'll have front row or yeah. um, uh, Radio One or whatever on in, in the background. There's also now a much more personal, chosen experience with podcasts, which is something which is growing very, very rapidly. Um, and actually, interestingly, is bringing back in the states types of radio that they'd completely abandoned. So the Americans mm -hmm. stopped making radio drama in the 70s, and now radio drama on podcasts is one of the really cool things that teenagers and young hipsters in Brooklyn like doing. So there's a kind of yeah. there's a traditional 
part of it and a medium which always had a strength which had been a bit eclipsed by TV and I think it also fits into, into modern life a lot. Having said that, you know, we are thinking very hard about radio for young people, particularly music radio, because streaming uh, is growing very rapidly. You know, 25% of young people use Spotify. Those who do use it for 10 hours on average a day, that's how much they used to use radio for. Mm. So we, and so renewing that radio habit is something that we're, we're putting a lot of attention to. And what about the, the sort of broader question of cultural consumption? You know, the BBC, you know, in, in the traditional Rethian version, it had this responsibility to the nation to educate yeah. it in the arts. You know, yeah. there's a very high arts kind yeah. of... Uh, concept that underpinned the BBC in the 20th century. I mean, do you still have that role, or is that too elitist? I mean, I can remember growing up with... Sorry, I keep re referencing my own childhood <laughs> here. Um, but, uh, you know, just the other day I went to, I went to see at the cinema a 1974 play for today called Pender's Fen, wow. which is actually, if you're interested in Englishness and the politics of Englishness, is a really interesting thing to wow. watch. Yeah. But I, I can't think in the same way about those kinds of moments of what felt quite like quite high culture quite innovative mm. um, programming mm. particularly drama um, mm. that you associated with the BBC in the 60s and 70s and perhaps don't do as much today we do a little bit of it so we did um, uh, a thing live at the National at the TV Centre just before it closed with the National Theatre Scotland and Battersea Arts Centre um, but you, you you can't rely now on an audience staying with a programme like that if it doesn't um, grab them immediately. So mm. once upon a time, we used to talk about hammocking in the media uh, when you and I were kids. You'd put on sort of EastEnders, then a harder thing, and then uh, a drama, and people would just sit down and stay for the whole thing. That sometimes works now with the right combination, but if it's not the right combination, people just turn off. And you just mm. see, you know, we got incredibly good audience data, and you just see people stay to the start, and then five minutes later or 15 minutes later, they, they were all gone. So we have to do the same thing, but do it in a way that grabs people and is it's much more pervasive. Mm. So a good example of that would be, uh, there was a piece on the 1st of July last year about the um, First World War called We're Here Because We're Here, which was a Jeremy Della piece, where suddenly uh, there were just people dressed up as, uh, uh, as soldiers from the First World War walking around you know, all over the country. Mm. Uh, and if you went up to them, they'd just hand you a piece of paper saying who they were and when they'd been killed. And it reached 40% of the country. Uh, so so mm. you can do it, you just have to do it in a different, in a different way. Mm. I think we, we are not doing it well enough for young audiences. So, so in the arts area, that's one of the things we're really thinking about uh, this year. Young people love the arts, you know, uh, if anything, more than previous generations. But because our content is, you know, uh, going out through Radio 4 and BBC 2 and BBC 4, that's brilliant for people who watch those services, but we need to find a way of reaching people who aren't on those, mm. on those services. Uh, you've just come um, from, from Cardiff to, to Bath. Uh, the B in the BBC, Britain, yeah. are totally unproblematically assumed in the 20th century yeah. when the BBC was created. Uh, the British state, British society, British inst in, then indeed still the British Empire, yeah. um, meant something yeah. um, that it doesn't any longer. Yeah. Um, and that, regardless actually of the kind of ebbs and flows of support for different parties, you know, the United Kingdom is no longer the kind of Great Britain that it used to be. So, so what does the B in the BBC mean when you've got a very different set of aspirations for programming, culture and consumption, politics, etc., in Scotland, yeah. Wales, England and so on? You know, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a big challenge, but I think it's one that, that we can answer. So it, it's much less paternalistic version of Britishness than I think you would have seen certainly at the start of the BBC. We're not here to proselytise about uh, the virtues of empire or a sort of particular version of Britishness. Uh, globally, we are about a certain set of values. I probably hesitate to call them British values, but, you know, we are about democracy, free speech. You know, the World Service does reach into the hardest places in the world to, to, be, a, to be a journalist. And then in the UK, it's about trying to reflect the variable geometry of the country and never get ahead of it, but also not get left mm. behind it. So in Scotland, we're launching a Scottish channel, uh, if we get permission from our regulator, to reflect the fact that there is now just much more politics and culture in Scotland, which is um, specific to Scotland, but we hope it will be of interest to the rest of the UK as well. So, you know, the right programmes will be both on 
the telly in Scotland, but also on the television in, in the UK. Um, in, in Wales, actually, Wales is the place where people love the BBC the most. That's our sort of you know, place with the highest approval rates. Radio 2, people, people love. They love TV, um, uh, BBC TV programmes. Um, but actually, the problem in Wales has been we haven't been making enough English language Welsh programmes. We haven't been able to reflect Welsh life enough in, in English and Wales. So, we're, so it's always about that balance between A, the UK services, and B, the individual nation services. Mm. B, it's about making sure we don't forget about England. So, you know, we now have more than 50% of our uh, team, well, our staff are outside of London. More, more than half of our money gets spent outside M25. Big base in, in, in uh, Salford, but also in Bristol, you know, one of, the, one of our most important bases. Uh, and then it's about both talking about the things that unite us and the things that divide us, the things that are... Uh, pleasant, you know, 2012, all those things, and the things which are difficult, and always being prepared to do both of that in, uh, in, in, our, in our coverage. And do you think you, you do give enough airtime to the different sort of voices of England? Um, you know, the, 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 is the BBC still too sort of dominated by the metropolitan perspective of people based in London? Yeah, I think that's always a risk that we have. So, so e even though we've gone, uh, we spread ourselves quite a lot outside of London, in the, last, uh, in the last 10 years, you still end up going to cities. So, mm. you know, actually, local radio, I think, is for, for the great exception to that for us. You know, you go to countryside, off here, or to, you know, the Hebrides, actually, a BBC service will be absolutely central to people's lives. Mm. But making sure that those, those voices are ones which come through on the, on the sort of network services is something we're always making, sort of paying attention mm. to. I think in... You know, in the referendum, that's one of the reasons why Five Live was such an important service, because it was outside of London, it was getting a different range of voices, and you could feel mm -hmm. potentially the result coming through in, in Five Live in a way that was quite, was quite special. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that is always, just because of being based in cities, that's always a danger, and that is something that we yeah. do try and uh, meditate against. Uh, well, before I open it up to questions, I want one final one from me, which is, when Britain joined the European community, mm. it very consciously started to think of itself and in its broadcasting and its broader, broader public life as, as a participant in a, in a European project. Mm. We, were, we were members of a new community yeah. and we thought of ourselves as, or we started to at least think of ourselves as European. What, what will happen with Brexit to the BBC? I mean, will we try to, to do what a number of leading Brexiteers demand, that suddenly we become global Britain and the BBC covers Asia more, or it covers North America or so on, or, or, and, and we start to not to think of ourselves mm -hmm. as participants in a kind of public debate about what happens in Europe, or do we, as you say, no, 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 even though we've left the European Union, we remain a European, a country on the European continent, albeit an archipelago. I mean, as always, it's, it's a bit like the same thing with the nations. We won't get ahead of where the country is and we try not to get behind it. So I think quite a lot of that will depend on how the UK the UK evolves. I would imagine that for us institutionally, we'll stay part of the European Broadcasting Union. You know, that, that is not a European Union defined body. So uh, we'll stay part of Eurovision for the people who, 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 <laughs> who, 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 care, about, uh, who care about that. Um, you know, I think even the most ardent Brexiteer thinks that we're leaving the European Union, not leaving, the, not leaving Europe. So yeah. it, it would be... Um, we definitely won't retreat in that in that way. In that sense, yeah. Okay, well, let's um, let's open it up to some some questions and discussion while we've got James here. To, from what's been r raised in the conversation, I've got I'll go to the back there to yeah to James James Copestake, yeah. Uh, okay, I was just trying to decide which question I was tempted to ask. You know, when we get out here, then we'll talk about Greece, but I'll uh, <laughs> get to that. I'll, I'll let that one pass unless you want to say something. Um, I'm. I guess, like quite a few people in the room, I've recently been asked to provide more information about my identity in order to use BBC iPlayer and, mm. and so on. And, uh, and this issue of sort of digital governance mm. is a big one in many arenas. So talk us through uh, the why you know, that was perceived to be necessary now, the risks, the worries, um, the, some of the problems you've had with that. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a very good question. Um, so you remember I was talking about hammocking, and we used to be able to get people to content that we thought they needed to 
or they might need to consume or they might want to consume and not know about by having them sort of not use the remote or not turn off the uh, change of the dial on the radio. We're getting people to sign in to compensate for the fact that that's becoming less uh, prevalent. So, you know, people sign into Amazon and they get recommendations saying customers like you also bought. We will do citizens like you also liked or we think citizens like you or license repairs like you might like X or you might, we think you need to know about Y. So it's, it's a way about being able to be a trusted guide which is personalised to you but isn't just about giving you more of what you want. It's about exposing you to stuff that you otherwise wouldn't have, have come across. So some of that is just you know, real convenience. If, if you go into, you know, I know from working at the BBC the richness of the content that we have, for example, about jazz. You know, if you're a jazz fan and you're looking for it, that is pretty hard. If you, in future, say that you like jazz music, we will be able to serve you in a much better way. But we'll also be able to give you stuff, you know, on the speech content, which isn't stuff you would necessarily have, have chosen. So there's a, you know, BBC's always had three traditional kind of pillars. One is making great content, second being a trusted guide, thirdly doing it for everyone. And by getting people to sign in, it really helps with that second, that second pillar. I think we're also really interested, and in the way I didn't answer your first question, Nick, about um, accountability. You, you know, the BBC's had lots of goes at accountability and mm -hmm. sort of talking to audiences about what they like and consultations. And actually, our, our previous um, regulator, the BBC Trust, did that really, really well, but was having to do it in quite a 20th century way. You know, we, we expect that we'll have 10 million people signed in by the end of this year. We're aiming for 20 million people. We can get to a world where we're collaborating with people day in, day out, and so, so that people are shaping the BBC organically and feel a, a greater sense of ownership of the way the organisation is developing, which A, I think will make us a better organisation, and B, when it comes to the next charter, our relationship with them is not mediated through newspapers, it's direct. So there's a, those are the two big reasons. One, to be a better trusted guide, uh, and secondly, to start to involve people more directly and to collaborate with them. In terms of issues we've had, you know, we are uh, committed to being gold standard in terms of how we use people's, people's data, uh, and we're very transparent about that, and we set that out on our, on, on, our, on our website. We have agonized about this for years, and actually, eventually we realized that pretty much every other organization does this, uh, and it, it had become quite accepted as a way of behaving, and so far, touch, touch wood, it does seem to have been widely accepted. You know, we'll, we'll see where we get to in maybe fa famous last words, but it'd be interested in your view about whether you think it's an imposition or not. Was it, was it was a privacy concern, James, or just that you weren't used to having to give that level of data about yourself? I mean, I suppose, you know, it was conditioned by the, the debate about nudge. Yeah. And so professors don't need trusted guides, is that the, uh, yeah, sort of, a bit of that? And, and I'm not sure I've still got a clear enough view of them. Apart from, you know, everybody else is doing it, and we might thought we might, we don't. Yeah. Sort of not being too far ahead, but not too far behind. I don't feel I've got a clear statement of exactly. Uh, and maybe you won't know until you try to do it. There's a bit of truth in that. There's a bit of truth. But, but do you, I don't know what your favourite radio service is, for example, but <coughs> do you... Tweet Sorry? Tweet of the day. Tweet of the day. Okay, so Radio 4. You sort of trust Radio 4 to come up with stuff that you might like next, and sometimes we'll get that right, sometimes we'll get that wrong. By personalising Radio 4, so say that you don't like comedy but you love start the week or vice versa we will be able to have that in your radio 4 now you can still listen to the absolutely normal radio 4 or you can have the personalized radio 4 and the independent scrutiny on how else you might use that data I suppose, yeah. sure uh, i mean we 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 are absolutely aiming to be at the completely um, pure end of how we use use data and it would be a real risk for us if we did anything else, even if it was so, so, so but yeah, we will be regulated in exactly the same way that everybody else is, um, and 
you know, we won't use it commercially, we won't pass it to governments, you know, there's the, the, the sort of, but we are thinking about that very, very hard. Mm. Does anybody in the audience not watch, listen, or consume anything from the BBC? You're not supposed to say that, James, you're on the IPR team, but there we are. <laughs> Only for work. <laughs> Only for, okay, so, so, but everybody else does engage with the BBC. No, you don't either, okay. So let me, let me ask you, where, where, where would you get your news from? Probably, you know, uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, that kind of thing, just kind of like different kind of, because uh, I kind of want more diversity in my, in my, in my um, news and kind of things. So it's kind of, I kind of follow social media sites where, you know, people of color kind of more represented it. Yep. So that's kind of the reason why I kind of don't watch the news as much. I okay. just don't feel that's like people right. like me are represented. Okay, so that's an interesting point. So the, 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 perhaps the BBC isn't re you know, reflecting yet properly the sort of diversity of the country enough? Or? Uh, so I think we, we've, so we, we survey ourselves a lot on that now. I think it's an issue which um, the BBC has really tried to grip in the last, in the last five years. Uh, so we, we know in, in terms of our workforce, we are now the most diverse broadcaster but we've still got further to go in terms of um, BAME leadership. So that's in terms of my role, that's the big area that I'm focusing on, is trying to get more diverse radio controllers and uh, ch children channel controllers. Um, uh, but we, in terms of workforce, it, it, it's not bad. In terms of portrayal, we are now, as an industry, going for a system where we monitor every single program and we'll be able to compare how we are doing both against population averages and against each, each other. Uh, and we will see later this year where the results come out in, in, in terms of that. I think we feel we've got further to go, basically. So we, we've, uh, we've had quite a lot of initiatives in the, last, in the last few years and there are some services which are uh, you know, Radio 1 or 1 Extra uh, would be would be pretty diverse. There's some other parts of the BBC which aren't as diverse as they should be. So oh, wait, what kind of what do the services do to be inclusive to more people of colour? And what kind of policies do you have towards you know encouraging more participation? So we um, we have an apprenticeship scheme. So we now have 250 apprentices. We'll have 400 next year. Uh, on our graduate uh, trainee scheme, over 50 percent of the people who come onto the trainee scheme are from BAME uh, backgrounds. Uh, we had a, an assistant commissioner scheme last year, which was only for people from BAME uh, backgrounds. We have a, a senior leadership scheme so that every division has someone from a, uh, that's not just BAME, it's also uh, disability, uh, attached to uh, members of the board. And we then look to support those people to find, to find, to find roles. We have a set of targets um, uh, to go from uh, where we were two years ago to the average of the places where we are. So the proportion of people who are gay or BME is significantly above the national average because we're in cities, so therefore we should be, we should be higher. Uh, and the survey that I mentioned showed that we'd now exceeded all of those targets. So for LGBT, um, for uh, disability, for women, for BME workforce, but not for BME leaders. Uh, so, and, and we're better on those uh, uh, criteria than other parts of the media. We do have an advantage, which is that the World Service obviously employs more people from BME backgrounds, so that, that boosts our numbers a, a little bit. So but yeah, we, we want to go further, and we've got some targets for 2020, which are, which are quite stretching. Um, so um, you said you talk, you were like encouraging like more people with disabilities and stuff, but do you have like policies towards helping not just, you know, people without physical, like noticeable disabilities, so encouraging people with autism or things like that? Do you have like yeah. interview processes that help them yeah. Uh, apply for jobs that are appropriate for we them. Do, we do. Oh, okay, that's good. Okay, that's some. We've, we've taken names and uh, uh, identifying factors out of our CV process. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thanks very much. So, yeah, gentlemen uh, here. Yeah, thank you very much for an interesting talk. I'm interested, I know news media is not your current news, but I'm interested in what the debate takes place at the executive level about the coverage, say, of recent terrorist attacks. Um, whether the level of coverage uh, stokes up fear and provides a platform for extremist views. And yes. how do you balance and reconcile um, right across that spectrum? Yes. We do talk about that. Um, 
as I was saying, you know, one of the things that is a, a really heartening feature of news at the BBC is this constant self-examination. Um, we, it's a balance in terms of not glorifying people, but also reflecting, trying to also have news items which talk about, uh, you know, overall is, is the world becoming more or less violent, all of those, all those kinds of things. In, in my area, um, after the Manchester attacks, for example, Newsround did a great guide for kids on what to ask if they're worried about, about mm -hmm. attacks. Uh, we now have a, a, a victims unit to make sure that people are only approached once and appropriately by the, by the BBC. Lots of people have had really traumatic experiences from having you know, 25 different media organisations after them, That's, so we try to do that. I don't know, it'd be interesting whether you think we, we, we get it right or not, or whether we've been too well, much on one side or the other. Clearly they are noteworthy events and, and need to be reported. Um, I mean, you know, I, again, like Professor Pierce, I've, I've lived a long time through the IRA campaign and things yeah. like that as well. So, um, and it's when you you provide a platform for yeah. a, a particular extremist voice by just covering things yeah. is, is a very difficult balance to take. Yeah. I mean, and my, my, my personal view is I think, I think you generally do in comparison to some of your more sort of commercial competitors. I mean, we, we, we do sometimes give a platform to extremists and to people who've been involved in terrorism because that's part of covering the whole issue. When we do that, we try to make sure that we challenge people absolutely appropriately. Sometimes we've got that wrong in the past, and you try and learn the lessons of, of, that, as, of that as well. So um, there's, a, there's a very interesting uh, program called Muslims Like Us, which I don't know if people yeah. saw, which was sort of slightly very formatted, as we'd say in TV. It was sort of a bit like a Big Brother house, getting lots of people who were from different parts of the Muslim community to come and spend, uh, spend two weeks together. And that had someone who was from an IS... Uh, Islamic State supporting background in it and I, I personally thought the program A, it reached a wide uh, audience who might not otherwise have uh, necessarily watched a program about the quite detailed differences between different parts of the Muslim uh, population of Britain and B, he was in that program and challenged appropriately and it was very illuminating about something otherwise you might not so it was a sort of popular way into some quite complicated issues that I thought was an example of us doing it right. Sometimes we haven't done it right. We've had people on and not challenged them in the right, in the right way. And in, in your new system of accountability, complaints about that kind of question go to Ofcom, is that right? Or they go to your board? They come to us first. Right. The vast majority of complaints get um, resolved by the producer. Um, we get 10 times as many complaints to us as the whole of the rest of the broadcasting industry put together. So we get quite <laughs> a lot of complaints. Um, which we take as a compliment. Um, <laughs> uh, so then most of them resolve that level, then they go to their boss, then they go to our board, and if they're not resolved, then people can complain to Ofcom. And we, we have the same code that the whole of the rest of the broadcasting industry has. But it's an interesting thing about the UK compared to other parts of the world, that you know, broadcasting in the UK, the news has to be impartial and, mm. and accurate. And whoever makes it, you can complain. and. Uh, Ofcom will take a, take a view. Newspapers, on the other hand, uh, not regulated in that way at all. And it's an interesting contrast, not just with the States, but with you know, quite a lot of mainland. I, I personally think it's a really, it's one of those things, it's slightly difficult to justify from first principles. You know, why should the New Statesman not have a television channel? Mm. Uh, why should the Spectator not have a television channel? Why is it that some you know, video in some ways is not regulated on the internet, but it is if it's broadcast? But it produces quite I think pro-public interest settlement where you have one kind of news on broadcast and you have a different one in online and in newspapers. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, lady there, yeah. Hi, I've just got a question about the BBC's commercial enterprises. Yeah. And I think as a, as a licence fee payer, I'm just left a little bit confused about stuff like BBC Worldwide. And I was just wondering whether you could help us understand, um, one, what the rationale is behind things like BBC Worldwide. Um, 
B, when you're producing content for that, what's the balance you have in terms of creating paid for content and content that licensed fee payers can um, uh, access? And also, perhaps slightly cheekily, whether there's a danger that the BBC is going to end up being the marketing arm of the UK government? So, um, in order, so the idea is to basically make programmes as cheaply as we can. So, for you know, we've had lots and lots of cuts in the last few years, and one of the ways we cope with that is by getting more commercial investment. So, something like the Night Manager would have you know huge investment from uh, uh, from AMC, uh, I think it was. Um, War and Peace was from the Weinstein Company. The big natural history program, sometimes we only pay for 20 or 30% of the cost. And that is financed not just through Worldwide, um, but a lot of it through, through Worldwide, who would go out and take those rights and exploit them in whatever the most appropriate way. So in some countries, we just sell those programs to local uh, TV channels or cable systems. In other countries, like America or Australia, we have a BBC commercial channel. Uh, in the UK, we are 50% owners of UK TV, who make Dave and Gold and food and services like that. So it's all about reducing the, the, the license fee would be 10 to 15% higher if we didn't have BBC Worldwide. We also think it's quite good for UK, um, I don't like the phrase soft power, but just sort of cultural, global presence. Uh, uh, and you know, it's great the Americans have strictly their version of Street Come Dancing is the most, pretty much the most popular of those types of programs in, in America. So it used to be very much about the commercial benefit. We're now trying to think more about what is the BBC's global imprint. And that then links into your third question, which is, you know, with the World Service, we get money from the government. We actually got a big increase in money from the, from the government last time. Um, is there a danger that people think that we are therefore compromised. Yes, that's always been a danger. From the, I mean, it, it, it can be a danger with the licence fee as well. Some people say that. The World Service has just got such strong editorial independence that I think with that one, we sort of overcome it. But it is something we're very, very... And we often have sort of, you know, normally behind closed doors, but quite a bit of toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Foreign Office about what they're able to do and what they're not, what they're not able to do. And the quid qu pro quo for you taking the World Service budget was that you would have to then deal with the f free licences for older people, I think I'm right in saying. Is that, is that correct? The it was one of the things that we were promised might happen when we did the... Uh, so so we, we took on the cost of people over 75 to get free TV licences. We will now... That used to be funded by the DWP. We will now fund that ourselves. Uh, we got a few things in return for that. So uh, we have stopped... They've stopped taking money from the licence fee to, to spend on prep projects. They've made clear that the people who use the iPlayer have to pay the licence fee. They, did, they decided to increase the licence fee in line with inflation. And in return, we're paying for, for free licenses for the F-75. And then they gave us a bit more money for the World Service. But, but although we were very grateful for that funding, it was funding to do new things. So it didn't help with cuts to the existing things that we were right. doing. Most of the way that we've coped with the cuts is through being more efficient and through greater commercial, commercial revenue. And presumably, the, the, the lesson from the election is you, you touch pensioner benefits at your peril, uh, that you'll leave the over 75s free licenses in place. I mean, do, you have a, do you have policy responsibility for it? I mean, is it something the BBC has both the funding and the policy responsibility for, or is it? Yes. So, so, so it's, it's, it's exactly like um, theatre has a concession. It's a, yeah, OK. It's a, okay, fine, yeah, yeah. OK, yeah, Jonathan. Yeah, my question is about trust. And I think that what I've heard from many of the questions here have been about trust and the trust that people have in the BBC. Yep. My primary interest in the BBC for media is for news and current affairs. Yeah. I don't really watch anything else, but I watch. You know, the BBC is my prime source. So I love the BBC. But I've really observed, um, both in my own response to the BBC and the changes which have taken place over the last two decades, um, and also in the way that it's portrayed more widely, that over an extended period of time, there's a, there's a reduction in the level of trust in the BBC mm. away from, you know, the, the BBC, which you can definitely trust mm. to tell you the truth, to one of many stories which you may hear. Mm. Um, last night, the 10 o'clock news was delayed, and I was on Twitter laughing at, there's still a lot of trust. I mean, people think the world's ended. You know, the 10 o'clock news... Uh, was well, it nice to have a bit of relief from all the news that we've been having? The sort of <laughs> public service we were providing for but, but do you think that the BBC accepts that actually there is no way to maintain the level of trust which it 
it's had historically. And actually, it's on a one-way slope to uh, have a reduced level of confidence by the public, and that the world in the future will be so different to the past that actually that's not something which it should be fighting against. I agree with the difference. I, I, we, we, we're not giving up on maintaining trust. Um, we survey it, and when we talk to people, the numbers that we get back are pretty similar to what they would have been 10 years ago. There was, there was a big dip after Savile, but it's broadly recovered. There was a dip in Scotland around the referendum, but again, that's, that's uh, come back up again. Not quite to the same level, but it has, has come back up. Uh, but it is a very different world, and the job of uh, being trustworthy in a multipolar, global, contested uh, political environment is a harder, harder one than, than before. You know, sort of. I remember uh, in the eighties or nineties, impartiality was you'd have you know the government spokesman, you'd have the Labour spokesperson, and that was it. Now you have to reflect it in a much wider, wider way. Um, and one of the things that's happened in the last. 10 years is now the BBC's trust is contested on both sides. So, so actually, you know, for a long time, it hasn't always been that this way in the BBC's history. Harold Wilson, for example, had big problems with the, uh, with the BBC. But for the last 20, 30 years, most of the challenge about the BBC, BBC's impartiality came from the, from the right. Now it comes as much from the, from the left, and it can be on particular issues. So it can be you know, Israel-Palestine is something where we have very, very strong views on, on, on both sides. Um, uh, and in the last election, as Nick was saying, there has been challenged about whether we've been part of the mainstream media and whether we've fairly reflected. And we take that very seriously and we look at it. And I, I think for us, the only answer to it is come back to the producer guidelines, do impartiality, objectivity, checking your facts, uh, and being determined to try and maintain the level of trust. But it goes beyond that, doesn't it? It goes, beyond, it goes to the business, really. I mean, many of the questions have been around the issues like data handling, or yep. the question which we just had about the commercial nature of you know, the cost yep. subsidies between things, the tax paying, but then yep. subsidizing some of the services with that. And I think it's that more than anything, which about you know, the that, corporate that aspect of the world changing is, 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 is the difficult bit to deal with. What, because people are more suspicious of something that's license fee funded and close to government or because, well, because I think the BBC is put in a place where actually it relies on favour right. and it's not fully funded. So right. it, it's required to cost subsidise right. and it's always right. trying mm. to get favour for for you know the mm. the, um, the revenue that it has. Well I suppose there's another way of saying James also that the, the license fee does come with yes. yeah. kind of problems as much as it's you know the sort of foundation of the BBC. Yes. I, I, look we are keenly aware of that and you know, I, I think having a range of media funded in different ways is the best answer we can have to that as a society. So having some entirely commercially funded media, some of them publicly owned, some of them individual owners, having us, uh, you know, you then got people who are public service broadcasters who are regulated for impartiality but commercially owned, us being publicly funded, that overall we can balance each other, you know, a story which doesn't get through one can get through, get through the other. Uh, back to the point we were making earlier, it, it, we, that's one of the reasons we're interested in having people sign in, because actually if we can collaborate with people, have them being more involved, can we get to a point where that is less of a dependency because we are, we're not a mutual, but we're more mutually influenced and mutually uh, founded. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not a perfect answer to it, but it, it, it should make us... Because you've got relationships with 20 million people, you're less dependent on your relationship with mm. two or three ministers. Yeah. Nick. Sort of related to the, uh, the licence fee issue, I think one of the great joys for me around the BBC is the uh, lack of commercial advertising. Um, you know, I think both on the TV and the radio, that is, is great. Um, but ever since I've sort of grown up politically from Thatcher onwards, there's always been this kind of debate about whether the licence fee should be scrapped and yeah. whether, uh, in essence, the BBC should be privatised. Yeah. Um, that seems to have gone off the radar a little bit of late, but I was just wondering what you felt, James, in terms of moving forward in the next few years, yeah. whether you thought that might come back onto the agenda and whether you know, certain uh, politicians and certain discourse might push for the privatisation agenda to be kind of reopened again. I sincerely hope not, by the way. I, I think it's a bit like politics. It's incredibly unpredictable, you know. So the next Charter Review is in 2028. 
will we be living in a world where we've gone swung very much over to pro-privatization, free market, uh, political consensus? Will we've gone to a sort of red Tory, blue Labour consensus? Well, I don't know. So mm -hmm. it, it, you're right. It, it, it was very much the dog that didn't bark in the last charter review. No one really argued, argued for it. I, I think it comes back to what we were saying at the beginning. If we can renew our mission to inform, educate, and entertain everyone, and all ages are feeling that this is something which is ind indispensable to society and valuable to them individually, it feels like moving, you know, moving to advertising takes all the resources out of ITV and Channel 4 in particular, and people don't like the option of not having adverts, and it influences the content in, in some ways, which you know, we balance by being influenced in different, different ways, like I was just saying in answer to the previous question. Subscription you know, goes against the kind of basic economic characteristics of, uh, of broadcasting in that, you know, I, can't live in Nick's house without that being annoying to Nick, but we can both watch Strictly Come Dancing without it being annoying. So mm. actually us all paying a little bit to all consume the same content is the economically rational way of funding at least some of broadcasting. So I think there's a very good economic reason why the license fee works. I also think that culturally in a world where you know, all the trends that we're speaking about today, fake news, trust, the um, balkanization of society, um, who, you can, who you can rely on, those all point to me to wanting the BBC as part of the mix. But well, every license fee, people say this is, every charter review, the economist normally says this is the last one for the license fee, it'll be gone next time, and they say it again the time after, but maybe there'll be a time when they're, <laughs> when they're right. Yes, question here, yeah. Um, I work in public relations and have done well, for nearly 20 years, I think. And for almost that entire time, they've been saying print is dying, print yeah. is dead. Um, what do you think? Do you think it will go? Do you think it, it, you know, it's going to stick around? Do you think it's going to have a resurgence because of that kind of retro feel? How do you feel about, about print media? I think it would be a terrible tragedy if I mean, print media, I think you mean sort of online and physical. Sort of. I, I, meant, I actually meant physical. Yeah, I meant magazines and newspapers, yeah, yeah. rather than online, yeah. Yeah, I think that would be terribly sad personally, but that may be, an, you know, that may be because of growing up with newspapers. Um, you know, I often think, wouldn't it be great if you had one place you could go to and someone had chosen all the news that mattered that day and maybe what sport you wanted to read and the kind of best theatre reviews. And so, so there, is a, there is, in the world of bloody hell, I spent all my time on Twitter, I'm not sure what I read, actually having a curated physical experience is a rather good thing. So I personally find myself, A, buying far more papers than I was five years ago and subscribing to papers as well because it, it feels like um, you know without independent journalism the settlement that we have in terms of free speech and democracy is massively massively challenged um, I suspect that you will see a lot of you're seeing a lot of innovation at the moment and I suspect that that's got a long long way to play out so you I hope that there will be innovation that actually finds ways of using um, the freedom of online media to fulfill that in a better way. I, I, I genuinely don't know whether that will happen or not. You know, it, it does feel like some of the economic uh, pressures on newspapers are getting very, very strong now. Uh, I mean, do, do, is there a role for the BBC in the circumstances where newspapers can't pay the salaries of journalists to do investigative work? The kinds of things that newspapers, yeah. you know, The Guardian, for example, it was known for many, many years, the Sunday Times, of having people that were really there to dig out the stories to, to you know, find out what people in power were hiding. Yes, so we're doing that with local papers. So we're now funding joint journalists between ourselves and, and local papers. We take license fee money and we jointly employ people. Uh, I think that would be difficult to extend to national newspapers. I think mm. there's a scrutiny that comes from being publicly funded that I'm not sure The Guardian or The Sun would particularly would want, would to, particularly want yeah. to be part of. But there may be other ways in which we can... Mm. There's certainly a role in terms of training journalists and all that, all, 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 all that kind of, all that kind of thing. Um, I think it does mean you want the BBC in the mix as well. I mean, having yeah. that sort of place somewhere to go to, which. Yeah. Okay. So, is there any any last questions? Anybody want to ask one before we finish up? So that in, on this, we let you go to the to the to the pub <laughs> or wherever else you want to go to get some um, uh, uh, something to help with the hot day. No, any more? No. OK. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for coming. But can I ask you to give a particular thanks to James for spending his time with us this evening and giving us a great account. Thank you.